I think he overthrew the president of Cuba in the year 1959 in a guerrilla warfare. The dictator who was overthrown was very repressive, corrupt, and also anti-communist and pro-American. America at that time was actually owning more than 50% of the sugar plantations, mines, and other utilities. It was expanding quite a bit in Cuba, and President Bitsat did not actually check America because he was pro-American. And then young Fidel Castro overthrew him, and he became the president. Soon after that, President Eisenhower of the United States of America has authorized CIA to do something with Fidel Castro. He authorized training of 1,400 Cuban exiles who were in Miami, over in Florida, to be trained in the warfare, and they should go back and hit at Fidel Castro and then have a different regime that is going to be once again pro-American. Finally, the government changed, and the term was over, and the new president, John F. Kennedy, was in position. And soon after he was authorized, he started this operation. And on a particular day, planes were supposed to leave Nicaragua and land at a particular spot in Cuba, obliterate the air strength that Cuba has got, whatever little and then disarm the resistance that you may have with respect to the soldiers within the Cuban uh, control. It so happened that the planes landed in a place which is a little different from what they intended to land. They missed all the targets. Before that, Fidel Castro knew that this was going to happen, safely kept away all the aeroplanes, overpowered the army, those, those brigade. The other rebels who arrived in ships were also captured. All in all, John F. Kennedy has actually withdrawn the second day strike which he planned. And once he withdrew, the people who were caught there, about the 1,400 people, were really not knowing anything to do. They were completely confused. And again, another set of planes were sent late, and they reached one hour late because of the time difference. And when they reached late, they were further overpowered, and that was a complete disaster of any invasion attempt made by United States of America in its history till now. And then, I thought I'll talk about war after a star-studded panel, so that it is a little more interesting. The lessons here is that this is the war cry of uh, Fidel Castro. He said, yes to Cuba, no to Americans. Yankees are Ar Americans. With, the, with this war cry, he started that battle, and it was completely pro-Cuban. And he also developed diplomatic relationship with Soviet Union. Their sugar import was banned in the United States. It was later purchased by Soviet Union. Some subsidies were coming in. The lessons here are very interesting for us. Apart from various other reasons why it failed, why the estimates went wrong, very, very interesting for us for the current topic today that we are discussing. It is called the Bay of Pigs debacle. The Bay of Pigs is an island, is a shore where they are supposed to land, which was an unexpected spot for them. It was a complete debacle because everything was miscalculated. President Kennedy was advised by those homogeneous decision makers who could not see any contrarian view. Partial views supplied based on uniform cultural assumptions. And this is what happens when you don't have diversity in your teams. You don't have divergent viewpoints and then you lead towards wrong decisions and wrong decisions can be as costly as this. Usually, Teams and organizations, nations, societies, they emphasize conformity, avoid difficult questions as we have seen in the past, and they also prevent independent thinking. This is anathema to diversity 
and nowhere real nowhere near to what we are going to talk about the inclusion today yes workplaces are a reflection of what is happening in the country in the society in a nation it has to reflect there are multiple people lot of differences and those differences will have to be taken care of plurality is a reality the volatile complex ambiguous uncertain world demands that we have to reinvent our products and services and process once again every time almost on a continuum basis therefore there is a necessity to be creative there is a necessity to be all the more robust in our launches of products and process and services diversity talks about a range of human or demographic differences and prime there are two dimensions to this diversity as we know age ethnicity gender physical abilities race sexual orientation is the primary dimension of diversity in the secondary is education background geographic location where you come from income level marital status work experience parental status and religious beliefs even political beliefs in simple language it is also called the caste creed kind of definitions they all fall under the first and the second dimensions of diversity and inclusion is a call to action inclusion is the broadest possible representation of all these diverse experiences and perspectives in a in one all encompassing manner it counters what is usually done of you know consciously or unconsciously the isolation of people based on caste or creed or class or skin color sometimes certain people based on their hair color or the dressing style are also alienated or not included in the mainstream of their plan and therefore if a call to action is sensitive and by strategy by volition integrates all these people it is it is inclusion and useful to the society and and the organizations teams with diverse personalities they they tend to improve the business the day to day business will improve because of the quality of the people we have seen in the classroom also we have students coming from all uh, parts of the country not just the geographical diversity we have gender diversity people with all kinds of abilities and disabilities and then what we actually do is we feed this data into the computer we have about say 1200 students in the classroom in in one batch in mba in one city we feed the data about gender work experience academic performance before uh, joining the b school region religion and then we want as diverse sets of 60 as possible into say 12 classrooms or into six classrooms or eight classrooms depending on the size of the section and then we get students who are synonymous from section a to section b to section c to section d but diverse within each section i think that was very consciously taken care of and if you leverage through inclusion by various activities and initiatives it is going to be uh, improving the day to day business a great deal demographic diversity is now moved to thought diversity and to inclusion this is as i said to address all kinds of biases that we have our own biases and others biases will be corrected because of this it requires respecting and accepting empathy listening skills listening skills is something very very interesting in organization setting we are so busy with our own day to day activities there is no room for listening now listening skills is extremely important in organization setting dignity trust at a value level dignity is something which go for example an individual is on a waiting period for example he is resigned and is serving the notice period organization value to respect that individual while on notice period itself is a bigger issue and then all these other issues will have to come into uh, come into the fore and it has to be accepted as part of the organization's core values decision making authority given to any of the subsect or sub ingredient of this diverse workforce is a major major achievement and access to information all do not have access to information in a normal setting diverse diverse workforces are are quite agile they anticipate respond and adapt to market changes they are quite innovative and receptive to new ideas whereas inclusion brings in more employee engagement retain 
they attract and retain talent and productivity goes up. As uh, the Association for uh, Fundraising uh, Professionals says, it is IDEA. IDEA is an acronym where it's easy to remember. So we have used that. Embrace diversity to maximize collective strength. This is true for even nations and political establishments. How do we develop cultural competence? Cultural competence is like, it is ingrained in the DNA of the organization and then we leverage this maximization and this becomes the culture of the organization as we move forward. Very, very important and it's a very long-term initiative. It doesn't happen just like that. It is not that you put all the ingredients in a mixy or a grinder and then it's going to work. It doesn't work like that. Inclusive behaviors. We discussed just now in the panel that inclusive behaviors have to be fostered and accountability be fixed for diversity. In certain organizations, affirmative action has got accountability. If you don't have certain set of people recruited, then there is, there is a penalty for that. There's an accountability. Similarly, accountability for diversity when we set the parameters that we need to have all kinds of individuals in the organizations by strategy, by design, then how do we ensure that they are very much there and if they're not there, uh, someone responsible has to be penalized. So d and is a strategic paradigm, therefore, diversity and inclusion is a strategic paradigm. Use technology to track, continuously check what kind of demographics do we have and where are we going wrong. Once you know the data, once you know that you're going on the right track or wrong track, then corrective action is possible. Certain businesses, for example, uh, Kellogg's. Kellogg's has started this long back, some 10, 15 years back or 20 years back. Even to their supply chain, they have incorporated diversity by sourcing certain raw material and products from women-owned businesses or minority-owned businesses and also funded the scholarships. If Diversity is a very, very important ingredient for them. Disability-friendly changes, if they are made in the recruitment process itself, that is where it begins. You want to have, disab you want to have an organization which is disability-friendly, and it doesn't happen by, by chance, by wish. It happens only by certain concrete measures. If the entire job, job design itself, and the recruitment process itself is changed. Need to have self-managed teams, collaborative and reflective behaviors. Reflective behavior is, is a behavior where you are encouraged to seek opinion and feedback from peers and others in the group and then correct yourself. And that kind of behavior and, uh, and practice is only going to help us. Away days are those days which, uh, which are spaces created for employees to go into uh, certain zones or, or little away from your regular office and then discuss and, uh, and then uh, seek ideas, cross-pollinate, so on and so forth. We are good at actually absorbing differences. When we absorb differences, there's no problem. You don't want to recruit women. You don't want to recruit people with disability. It is very difficult to maintain, manage. So vibes like positive vision of diversity is more important and significant to an organization than downplaying, although downplaying is very easy. And it, it works better integrates better with dialogue and not a top-down imposition. It's a source of creative, uh, creativity and innovation, as I said earlier. It's not a, it's not a ethical imperative, it's actually a business imperative, and presence of diversity, diversity is more significant in overcoming complex problems. Unless and until we get to that point of deploying diversity, leveraging it through inclusion, we will not be able to realize that we can solve complex problems. Organizations have deployed people from various ethnic uh, communities and consumer groups who are in the, in the workforce to conduct market research and give ideas about product design, give ideas about uh, product messaging so that you expand into new market territories and also increase your business. So business development is possible and this is strategic imperative. It is a business imperative and not just a feel-good concept. And, and, and when, we move, when we move beyond the stipulations of uh, statute or compliance stipulated by the law, we, we then have really arrived at this D&I uh, strategy. There are all kinds of people in workforces like, in, like, like educational institutions, for example, you have older teachers and you have younger teachers. Younger PhDs are actually joining the workforce in universities and colleges. 
what we realized is that the younger teachers are very good, very tech savvy, and uh, we have we have realized that you know data analysis is very much possible. They're quite pro in understanding the data and helping. Whereas the senior faculty members ask specific questions as to, for example, students who are getting placed first, are they the toppers? Or toppers are getting placed first or last? And students who are very active in clubs, students who are very active in dramatics or general activities on campus, leadership roles, are they also very successful after the first job? When we correlate, put the data and see, that process is helped by the younger faculty members, guided by the senior faculty members, and it works extremely well for us. I think it is, it is assimilation and it is a question of utilizing these two forces properly and then moving forward. Yes, the movie in turn also has given us some examples that mature employees are useful to the organization and they tell you the finest tips about maintaining employee relations, interpersonal relationships, so on and so forth. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I would like to leave with this one, one thought. Africa has won the World Cup. Any response? No, no response. <laughs> Trevor, the daily show host, he said Africa has won the World Cup and he congratulated them. So the ambassador of uh, France to the US mentioned that it is, it is far too less from truth and they quite objected that it actually uh, stereotypes that only white people can be French and black people cannot be. The fact is that a large majority of the players in the French uh, football team that won the World Cup are of African uh, uh, descent. And therefore, uh, the, the host said, it is a congratulatory message to them. So the debate continues, who is more diverse, who is more inclusive? Is it the French team which says that they are all part of the fra France as a nation? or United States, which gives you the dual identities. You can be Indian, at the same time you can have a celebration on August 15th within the United States of America, and you can live there very, very uh, nicely without any problem. You can celebrate your differences, you can celebrate your identities, and you are also identified with the United States of America. Whereas French says, you, you are a French national, you may have, your parents may have born elsewhere, uh, or, who is more diverse? Is the, is the host who is more diverse? Or is the, is the nation like France more diverse? Or United States of America is more diverse and inclusive? Is what is the debate for us to take forward? Thank you very much.